Hi guys. Tonight we're going to stick with our topic of conditioning um, and so now we're going to talk about operant conditioning. Last night we talked about classical conditioning which um, really works on our sort of involuntary actions like the dog's response to the food is involuntary meaning it wasn't a conscious action. Uh, so tonight uh, when we talk about operant conditioning we're talking about conscious behavior, voluntary actions. So we're changing our behavior over time. So the book defines it as operant uh, conditioning involves adjusting to the consequences of, of our behaviors so that we can easily learn to do more of what works and less of what doesn't work. It's very simple. So we may smile at, more at work after this repeatedly gets us bigger tips. We learn how to ride a bike using the strategy that don't make us crash. So it's pretty simple. An act of chosen behavior or response is followed by a reward or punitive feedback from the environment. Results, the reinforced behavior is more likely to be tried again. And if it's punished, the behavior is less likely to be chosen in the food in, again. So here we go. The seal is balancing the ball on his nose. If he does a good job, he gets some food. So then he continues to balance the ball on his nose, so he continues to do food. It's like when I train my dog to sit. How do you do it? You give him a treat every time he sits. If he doesn't sit, he doesn't get the food. So this is how operant conditioning works. You're kind of changing how your behavior operates consciously. So there's a there's some differences between operant and classical conditioning, but they're both forms of associative learning. So as I said, classical conditioning involves respondent behavior, meaning involuntary actions, reflexive automatic actions, reactions such as fear or craving, like the dog, or like when you're scared of the thing getting sprayed in your face. These reactions to unconscious stimuli become associated with the neutral, which then is conditioned stimuli. So remember Pavlov's dog associated the bell, which was the neutral stimuli, with the unconditioned stimuli, which was the food. So operant conditioning is a little different. So these chosen, these involves operant behavior, meaning chosen behaviors which operate on the environment, things that we do and that we're aware of doing them. So these behaviors become associated with consequences which punish or decrease or reinforce, increase the operant behavior. So this is what we're talking about, reward and punishment. Rewards reinforce the behavior and punishment discourages the behavior. This is what our law system is based on, as I mentioned, what uh, religion might be based on. So there's a contrast in the process of conditioning. Uh, in classical conditioning, the experimental or neutral stimulus repeatedly precedes the respondent behavior and eventually triggers that behavior, so it happens beforehand. Whereas in operant conditioning, the experimental consequence stimulus repeatedly follows the operant behavior and eventually punishes or reinforces that behavior. So the neutral stimulus in, operant, or in classical conditioning comes before the behavior, and in this case, the stimulus becomes after the behavior. So in a classical conditioning, there's something that happens before the desired behavior, such as the bell being ring simultaneously with the food. And in operant conditioning, it follows after. You're rewarded or punishment, or punished, based on if your behavior was good or not. So the guy that figured all this out, name was B.F. Skinner. Uh, he saw potential for exploring and using this guy Edward Thorndike's principles much more broadly. He wondered... How can we more carefully measure the effect of consequences on choosing behavior? Also, what else can creatures be taught to do by controlling consequences? And what happens when we change the timing of the reinforcement? So this guy, he trained pigeons to play ping pong and guide a video game missile. So he was really good at rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. So he had this thing called the operant chamber. It sounds like a medieval torture device or something. Uh, but Skinner, like Pavlov, pioneered, he pioneered more controlled methods of studying conditioning. He took Pavlov's work a step further. So this chamber, often called the Skinner box, which is usually what it's called, allowed detailed tracking of rates of behavior change in response to different rates of reinforcement. So if you look at this, the rat, um, there's a bar or lever that the animal presses randomly at first, later for reward. And then if he presses it, he gets a food and water for the reward. And the recording device kind of records everything that's happening. 
So the rat's, every aspect of the rat's behavior is recorded. Um, his heart rate, um, if his brain activity changes, everything is, is uh, recorded. So Skinner was really able to see how small changes in rewards and punishment affected the physiology of the rat. That's what's important here. So he's looking at how behavior changes our physiology, our biology. Now reinforcement refers to any feedback from the environment that makes behavior more likely to recur. Reward. So positive adding reinforcement. So this is adding something desirable, such as warmth. This is the reward that I was talking about. So if you look at the meerkat here, he's getting rewarded by this blast of African sunlight being simulated by the heat lamp. And then negative reinforcement is taking away, ending something unpleasant, the cold or whatever. Um, so, but either way, um, you're encouraging the behavior. So either you're taking away something that sucks or you're adding something that is desirable. Yeah, there's the meerkat. He looks like he's chilling. So there's this cycle of mutual reinforcement. So ch children who have a temper tantrum when they're frustrated may get positively enforced, reinforced for this behavior when parents occasionally respond by giving in to the child's demands. So who's controlling who here? Result, stronger, more frequent tantrums because the adult is getting conditioned to respond to the child's stimulus, which is crying or a tantrum. So parents who occasionally give in to the tantrums may get negative reinforced when the child responds by ending the tantrum. So the result of that, the parents giving in behavior is strengthened, giving in more and more often. So then we have what's called discrimination. So this refers to the ability to become more and more specific in what triggers the response. So shaping can increase discrimination if reinforcement only comes for certain discriminative stimuli. For example, dogs, rats, and even spiders can be trained to search for very specific smells, from drugs to explosives. Uh, in the same way, pigeons, seals, and manatees have been trained to respond to specific shapes, colors, and sh uh, categories. So this is the opposite of what we talked about yesterday in generalization, where you kind of associate a general stimuli with a certain response. In this case, in discrimination, you're very, very specific in what triggers a response. So for the bomb finding rat, it's only a very, very specific uh, stimulus that triggers the response. So then it's the same with any animal that's really trained very, very specifically. You're not, so the, the rat will only respond to a very, very narrow range of stimuli, maybe one certain scent. Anything else doesn't trigger that response. So this is discrimination. All right, that will do it for this evening. I hope you're doing well, and I will see you tomorrow.